Hello everyone, my name is Drishan, and in this video, I'll be explaining simplex noise. So, in order for me to explain simplex noise, it's helpful to have an understanding of noise and the types of noise. In computer applications, noise is a mapping from Rn to R. You input an n-dimensional point with real coordinates, and it returns a real value. Noise appears random, but really isn't. Instead, it's pseudo-random, or it gives the appearance of randomness. In the realm of computer graphics, noise is used for a variety of things, such as rendering natural phenomena, materials, and adding imperfections. One use of noise in game development is procedural map generation. There are two types of noise, value noise and gradient noise. Value noise methods consist of creating a lattice of points which are assigned random values and the noise function then returns the interpolated number based on the values of the surrounding lattice points. Gradient noise methods on the other hand, consist of creating a lattice of gradients, dot products of which are then interpolated to obtain values in between the lattices. Here are two visualizations of gradient noise. On the right is Perlin noise, invented in 1985 by Ken Perlin, and on the left is simplex noise, which was created also by Ken Perlin in 2005. While Perlin noise is quite useful, it has significant shortcomings that would be of particular consequence in real-time settings and hardware implementations. Some of these shortcomings include requiring many multiplies, visually significant and isotropy gradient artifacts, difficulty of computing a derivative, and the expense of generalizing to higher dimensions. To generate Perlin noise in one dimension, you associate a pseudo-random gradient or slope for the noise function with each integer coordinate and set the function value at each integer coordinate zero. For a given point x somewhere between the two integer points, the value is interpolated between the two values. The interpolation is not linear with distance because that would not satisfy the constraint that the derivative of the noise function should be continuous at the integer points. Instead, a blending function is used. Originally, Ken Perlin used this black function, 3t squared minus 2t cubed. However, he later changed it to the red function, which is a fifth degree polynomial. The two functions are very similar, but the fifth degree curve also has a second derivative at its endpoints, which makes the noise function have a continuous second derivative everywhere. Uh, this makes it useful for certain tasks in computer graphics. In 2D, the integer coordinate points form a regular square grid. At each grid point, a pseudo-random gradient is picked. For an arbitrary point P on the surface, the noise value is computed from the four closest grid points. The value of each gradient ramp is computed by the dot product between the gradient vectors of each grid point and the vectors from the grid points to the point P. The blending of the noise contribution from the four corners is performed in a manner similar to bilinear interpolation using the fifth-order blending curve to compute the interpolant. The result, n sub xy, is the final value of the noise function for the point xy. In 3D, the gradients are three-dimensional and the interpolation is performed along three axes, one at a time. In order for the noise function to be repeatable, the gradients need to be pseudo-random and not truly random. So they need to have enough variation to conceal the fact that the function is not truly random. But too much variation will cause unpredictable behavior for the noise function. 
A good choice for 2D and higher is to pick gradients of unit length, but different directions. For 2D, 8 or 16 gradients distributed around the unit circle is a good choice. Uh, for 3D, Perlin's recommendation was a set of gradients that are the midpoints of each of the 12 edges of a cube centered around the origin. For 4D, a suitable set would be the 32 edges of a four-dimensional hypercube. The gradients that we pick uh, don't matter as much as long as they are not too few and they are reasonably evenly distributed over all directions. Gradients with values of only 0, 1, and minus 1 for each component are chosen because taking a dot product with such a vector does not require any multiplications, only additions and subtractions. To associate each grid point with exactly one gradient, the integer coordinates of the point can be used to compute a hash value, which in turn can be used as the index into a lookup table of the gradients. Now that you have a general idea of classic noise, let's move on to simplex noise. So the main advantage of simplex noise is that instead of using hypercubes, we use simplices because a hypercube in n dimensions has two to the n corners, whereas a simplex in n dimensions has only n plus one corners. As we move to higher dimensions, the complexity of evaluating a function at each corner of a hypercube and interpolating along each principal axis is a big O of 2 to the n problem, or exponential, and it quickly becomes intractable. A similar evaluation for each corner of a simplex followed by interpolation has a polynomial complexity of O of n squared. One of the main problems with classic noise is that it involves sequential interpolations along each dimension. So apart from the increase in computational complexity as we move to higher dimensions, it becomes more and more of a problem to compute the analytic derivative of the interpolated function. Instead, simplex noise uses a straight summation of contributions from each corner, where the contribution is a multiplication of the extrapolation of the gradient ramp and a radially symmetric attenuation function. The attenuation function in signal processing terms is a signal reconstruction kernel. The radial attenuation is carefully chosen so that the influence from each corner reaches zero before crossing the boundary to the next simplex. This means that a point inside a simplex will only be influenced by the contributions from the corners of that particular simplex. For 2D, the influence from each corner can be visualized as a small surflet function around the corner point, with any point on the surface having at most three non-zero parts of a surflet covering it. A typical implementation of simplex noise involves four steps, coordinate skewing, simplical subdivision, gradient selection, and kernel summation. In the following part, I will go over each step in some more detail. In the first step, coordinate skewing, we take an input coordinate and transform it using the formula shown here. This effectively places the coordinate on a lattice, which is essentially the vertex arrangement of a hypercubic honeycomb that has been squashed along its main diagonal until the distance between the zero vector and one vector become equal to the distance between the points of the zero vector and the vector containing one in its first entry. The resulting coordinate x prime, y prime, and so on, is then used in order to determine which skewed unit hypercube cell the input point lies in, and its internal coordinates, xi prime, yi prime, and so on. 
Here is a visualization of a simplex grid being skewed in 2D. Just like in 2D, uh, a 3D simplex grid can be skewed to a regular cubical grid by scaling along the main diagonal, and the integer parts of the coordinates for the transformed point can be used to determine which cell of six simplices the point is in. Once we have determined the internal coordinates, we sort them in descending order to determine which skewed Schleffli orthoscheme simplex the point lies in. In geometry, a Schleffli orthoscheme is a type of simplex uh, that is defined by a sequence of edges that are mutually orthogonal. The resulting simplex is composed of the vertices corresponding to an ordered edge traversal from the zero vector to the one vector, of which there are n factorial possibilities, each of which correspond to a single permutation of the coordinate. In other words, we start with the zero coordinate, successively add one starting in the value corresponding to the largest internal coordinates value and end with the smallest. For example, the point, point 0.4, point 0.5, point 0.3 would lie inside the simplex with vertices 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1. Since the y sub i prime coordinate is the largest, it's added first, then the x i prime, then finally the z i prime. For the 4D case, Visually, things become incomprehensible, but the methods presented for 2D and 3D generalize nicely. Sorting the x, y, z, w coordinates within the hypercube would reveal 4 factorial or 24 possible outcomes for the ordering of the magnitude of the coordinates. And each particular ordering is unique to one of those 24 simplices. The next step is gradient selection. In this step, each simplex vertex is added back to the skewed hypercubes based coordinate and hashed into a pseudo-random gradient direction. There are numerous ways to implement the hash. Most often, it uses a permutation table or a bit manipulation scheme. In order to keep directional artifacts to a minimum, we need to take care in selecting the set of gradients to include. At the last step, kernel summation, the contribution from each of the vertices of the simplex is factored in by a summation of radially symmetric kernels centered around each vertex. First, the unskewed coordinate of each of the vertices is determined using the formula shown here. This is just the inverse of the formula from the first step. This point is subtracted from the input coordinate to obtain the unskewed displacement vector. This unskewed displacement vector is used for two purposes. One, to compute the extrapolated gradient value using a dot product, and two, to determine d squared, the squared distance to the point. From there, each vertex's summed kernel contribution is determined using the equation below. R squared is usually set to either 0.5 or 0 0.6. 0 0.5 ensures no discontinuities, whereas 0 0.6 may increase visual quality in applications for which the discontinuities are not noticeable. 0 0.6 was used in Ken Perlin's original reference implementation. So all of this can be put into code, and it can be implemented in various programming languages. Uh, for my implementations, I use GLSL, which is the OpenGL shading language. By adding a few constraints and cutoffs to the original reference implementation, we can retain fire. Here is an example of a different function value, which 
was made to produce smoke. Here is a case of a slightly tapered, quantized simplex noise where the contours show the difference in intensity for the noise values. The background to my presentation was created using the exact same function as this with a different number of contour lines and a slightly different rotation hue formula. Here is an example of goo, which was made using ray marching and subsurface scattering along with simplex noise. So this project was based from the paper Simplex Noise Demystified by Stefan Gustafsson. I found his visualizations to be quite helpful. The original algorithm was presented by Ken Perlin in Noise Hardware, which is chapter two of the real-time shading course notes from SIGGRAPH in 2001.